Hello, Anne. Hello, Anna. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing uh, to do the interview with me on Beyond the Dance Floor. I'm really looking forward to speaking to you and to asking you questions. And I'm sure a lot of people are also looking forward. I, in fact, I know a lot of people are looking forward to this interview as well. Oh, thank you so much for asking me. And uh, thank you for giving women a platform because I've listened to many of the interviews that you've given and they're just wonderful to hear you know, the, 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 the female side of their, you know, partnership stories. And uh, I, I found it absolutely fascinating. So thank you for giving women a super platform. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I really enjoy talking to everyone as well. And, you know, I, every time I do an interview, I go away from, with a lot of inspiration and information and things to think of. So I really appreciate you agreeing to do it as well and all the other women who have agreed to do it as well. Thank you. So let me ask you first uh, how you're coping with the current situation, where you are, and how do you feel about it? Okay, so first of all, I'd like to say to anybody that's watching this, I'm, you know, I, I have great sympathy, you know, if you've been touched by the virus and, you know, it's been a tragic time for, for, for many. So, you know, I send my best wishes to everybody that may have been affected. Uh, we have been very fortunate to be at home. We're in Isha in Surrey in, in the UK. Uh, our daughter is with us and has been living at home for a year. So we've had some really precious time to cherish as a family. Um, I think it's been a wonderful time to reflect, uh, to you know, really put your life into some perspective as well. And so we've really uh, had a, a wonderful uh, lockdown all together as a family, which has been a true blessing. Um, our day is, uh, it's a bit like a military operation, or as Richard said, it's like being in prison. <laughs> um, uh, I guess, our, well, our natural alarm is 6.30. Um, I do 10 minutes of Pilates, 10 minutes of aerobic exercise, have breakfast, and then I'm out in the garden by eight o'clock in the morning, if it's a nice day. Mm -hmm. And for the first seven weeks of lockdown, uh, I was in the garden uh, every day. And for me, it's an absolute haven. Uh, we're lucky to have a garden, I should say that, because, you know, I know if you're living in a flat or mm -hmm. um, these situations, you know, it, we, so we feel incredibly lucky to have a garden. And uh, when I've been in the garden for many, many hours, which I do spend, uh, my... Uh, thought process, of course, is totally focused on nature. And, uh, but when I come away from it, my thought processes are very, very clear. So I find that's my uh, little salvation going into the garden. And the other thing that we've managed to do as a family is really uh, catch up so much on reading and study. So my life study is philosophy. And uh, the reason I'm so interested in it, because I believe that philosophy is at the heart of every subject. So if we're talking politics, law, science, mathematics, critical reasoning, dance, music, any of these things, philosophy lies at the very heart of it. So I, I kind of still have a bit of a childish curiosity about things. So for me, that's uh, enabling me to, to continue to learn and uh, develop my wisdom so that makes me happy and so we've had uh, i must say against the backdrop of the tragedy we've had a very very blessed lockdown a positive experience in a way of course indeed I yes. fact that it's not a positive situation but yeah that's right that's right yeah okay so if you go if we go back to your roots and to the beginning of your dance career can you tell me how you started dancing what brought you into dancing and how did you progress through your early years and how did you end up with john okay uh well my parents wanted my sister and i to be able to go to a dinner and dance when we were older and to uh, have the opportunity if somebody asked us to dance that we would be able to do so. So their thoughts really about uh, dancing was as a social grace. They weren't really thinking about um, anything connected to compete competitive dancing. 
So, uh, of course, I got hooked, really. Uh, and um, so I did my medals between the ages of six and ten. I started at six. And then the teacher suggested that I took my medals as man in Borum and Latin. And that was really helpful because, as we all know, in those days, particularly, there was a big shortage of boys. So I used to have to dance as man in the, in the classes. So, of course, that helped greatly in later life. And then as a juvenile and junior, I was predominantly a ballroom dancer. But I had this burning desire to be a Latin dancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just had to follow that dream. Uh, I just loved Latin and I still do to this day. So for four years, I became a Latin dancer and I danced as an amateur with James McKechn. And in those days, uh, amateurs had a normal job. And the job I had was at the University of Nottingham and I worked for a professor of human morphology. So it's basically where people give their, donate their bodies to science. So that job became um, a huge life experience for me because I became exceptionally interested in the structural system, the muscular system. Um, I was typing up the professor's lecture notes and in fact I learned from that how to lecture and as a result of that I actually really love lecturing mm -hmm. so uh, that was you know gold dust really to have that life experience um, however I will say that when you're in an academic environment um, you're you you do doubt your intelligence all the time and you you feel inadequate um, so of course, my brain's thinking, well, maybe I should be going back to school and perhaps this is my destiny. Because after four years, the dancing, that, uh, the Latin American dancing, was not progressing in the way I'd hoped. And so I thought, well, maybe, maybe my destiny is to go back to school, even though I love dancing from the absolute depths of my soul. Um, so at the end of my partnership, um, I, I'd really kind of decided, well, I will, will go back and study. And then two days later, John Wood phoned me and uh, he came up to have a tryout and we did one natural turn together. And he said to me immediately, that's it, we'll, we, we can dance together. I want to dance with you. And I, of course, my brain was in a bit of turmoil. I, I said, oh, no, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. I, I need to think about this. And I remember afterwards he said to me, what a cheek. There you are absolutely nowhere in Borum and saying to me, I need to think about it. Um, but I remember phoning June McMurdo and I said to her, I really don't know June about this because my, I suppose my reservation was that I didn't know if I really wanted to be, and this is in my ignorance, stuck in this ballroom hold for seven rounds of five dances. And, you know, I thought this isn't dancing in my stupidity. So anyway, she said to me, well, how did it feel? And I said, you know, June, it was absolutely wonderful. And she said, well, you know, Anne, if you love dancing, you love Latin, you're going to love ballroom. So, you know, take this opportunity, which I did. And it was the best thing I could have done because, of course, my life, I could be working, you know, in an office somewhere by now. So it, it was my destiny to dance with John. So. Uh, going back to your Latin times, uh, do you feel that it has given you something for ballroom as well or for your general dance education? And uh, from that perspective, what do you think about younger kids, younger dancers continuing to do 10 dance for as long as possible? Do you think it is beneficial? And would you advise from your experience them to do so? I, well, I certainly would. Um, I think that my personal wish list, my personal goal, when I started to dance with John, was that I would be able to utilize the freedom, flexibility, mobility, and uh, musicality in my body in a ballroom hold. And, and, and I wanted to employ all of those things, as I said, that I'd, I'd, I felt I'd achieved in Latin American and put them into this ballroom hold. So, and I felt that that would possibly be, at the time, something that would be unique. And, you know, just by um, example, the era that I danced in, Karen Hilton, uh, Lorraine Barry, myself, Adele Preston, we were all dancing 10 dances for a very long time. And I think that was perhaps one of the 
reasons why the era that we danced in was a developmental era in ballroom. So um, therefore, you know, relative to, to medal tests or, or competing, the longer that you can maintain the two styles of dancing running in parallel with each other, I really believe uh, that is uh, the finest way to go because Latin American gives you this incredible understanding of balance, speed of body, strong feet and ankles, you know, precision of time. And then ballroom, of course, gives you the interaction of two bodies, the lead and follow sensations. And so they are all, you know, cross-referencing all the time. So yes, as long as you can keep maintaining the two styles, really the better. Uh, so, as a female part of the couple, what do you feel you have contributed to your partnership, to any partnership, and uh, particularly to your partnership with John? What do you feel your role was in this partnership? Well, um, as I said about wanting to bring this Latin American freedom into ballroom hold, I suppose I felt that that was my biggest goal. And that gave me tremendous pleasure to be able to uh, try and develop that area of my dancing. And fortunately, uh, John was very open-minded. We had uh, a very good weight ratio because he was another third on top of my weight. Mm -hmm. So basically any activity that I wanted to produce, particularly within the upper structure where the real dance is going on, he was never disturbed by that and allowed me that freedom. So he had very, very flexible arms, which allowed me the, the space and opportunity to find my balance and, and range and so on. So I suppose that's in the physical sense. In the psychological sense, uh, because uh, my mother was a, a perfectionist in everything she did, and they do say that you're more um, influenced by your environment than actually what you're told to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say in my case, that's, that's, the, that's the, the case. And so uh, I was a great perfectionist and, and everything had to be right. And I think where, you know, John and I were a good team was because we were quite opposites, actually, in psychologically speaking, we were opposites. Um, he was generally a very happy person. And, and I was what you would call, I suppose, a bit of a moody bitch. <laughs> um, <laughs> difficult, moody. Um, you know, he was, uh, he loved competing. Um, I, I must say, I, I found it incredibly difficult to compete and I couldn't think about competing. Um, he was spontaneous and um, he would read an audience and know exactly what to do in the moment at Blackpool. And he could, you know, play with an audience. And, and I had to plan things months in advance mm -hmm. uh, and be very clear about what I was doing. Although of course, as a dancer, I was in the moment, but yeah. so as two halves, we made a whole, if you see what I mean. So I think that was my contribution to mm -hmm. the partnership. And it was, it was the opposite. We were kind of contrary or polar opposite. So that's why I think it worked because we both brought something to the partnership that was actually really, white polar opposites and but it but it, you know that's that's why i guess it worked yeah i guess this is the also recipe to something special isn't it that you yeah. you had something different to give and then as a whole you had the versatility i suppose in, in that's, your that's right and, and i guess very fortunate that john although he'd been a ballroom champion he was very open-minded and he 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 was so generous really in allowing me to experiment even though I was not in his category at all. Um, so I think that was a lot of generosity of spirit on his part. Mm. And wisdom perhaps as well. Absolutely, absolutely, yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that the competitions were, you didn't really enjoy necessarily as much as maybe someone who is very competitive. Uh, how did you motivate yourself and what uh, drove you to, yeah, to become better, to become successful? I worshipped the art of ballroom dancing. That was my motivation. Obviously, I, I didn't worship competing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think because we, as a couple, 
had uh, you know basically decided our system which maybe I could talk a little bit about later it uh, cemented really our desires to focus fundamentally on the feel of our dancing we were very interested in the feel of what we were doing and the art of what we were doing and the timing of it so I feel that although John was an exceptionally healthy competitor and you know he he found it I think relatively easy um, as, as a male dancer to compete and, and was exceptional at it and there, there was the strength really that he could compete and then I think as a couple we didn't really intend to compete I think although we were doing it we were focused on performing and uh, really experiencing the art of dancing and through that we then landed up with certain competitive results so that was the result of the way we approached our dancing and I think John was quite conscious that I wasn't comfortable with competing so he was always very aware of our practices being focused on perfecting um, our harmony our dancing together and uh, you know the way we approached our whole dancing life was very much about the art and the feel and the musicality and you know we, we tried to not talk too much about the competitive side of things mm -hmm. so that we weren't putting ourselves under undue pressure because I was doing that anyway. <laughs> So that was more of a natural of a natural result of the approach that you were taking. The competitiveness yeah. became something that came out That's of it, rather than you you developed it. That's okay. right. So, yeah. um, what is your biggest passion in dancing? What is it that you love about it most for yourself uh, as a dancer, as a teacher, and also when you're watching the couples? Okay, so um, as I say, my wish list if I go back to that was about bringing this dynamic dance to ballroom uh, which I, I absolutely uh, loved it was what I wanted to do and our whole lives really competing were um, connected to that our combined assets if you like were that John was this incredibly powerful dancer uh, with wonderful timing mm -hmm. and feel and I felt that I could counterbalance that with with the flexibility and, and so on and, and this awareness and touch and sensitivity so our combined goal was to generate the power and motion through the strong legs and hips uh, also of course the center of mass controls the movement of the mass mm -hmm. so the perfect system for us and that gave us the greatest joy was reflexive power and in reflexive power of course it, it, your base is the major engine and then you know the the reaction is going through all the joints of the body particularly the upper body where the music really the real dance and a music and expression of dance comes from so this was our goal strength from the legs and, and hips and dance and musicality from the upper body and what we managed to achieve, I felt, particularly in practices and even, of course, shows and, and competitive dancing, you know, what we were trying to do was sensuous. You know, we were, it was like we were inside each other's joints. So, you know, I, I think it, what we were trying to do was kind of sexy ballroom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, all the Latin people think they, they're having the best time. But, um, yeah, it was just wonderful. I felt sensuous dancing. So... That is my passion. And of course that comes from uh, the essence of ballroom dancing, which of course is to dance together. But it's also for us, it was about uh, reflexing, reflex power, A, within the individual, then the reflex into partner. And then this is where my wish list came in, that as I was able to reflex through the upper body and, and, and so on, then what would happen is that would reflex back into John. So we were juggling weight and juggling the natural forces in dancing. So everything we tried to do is based on the natural forces and not on um, you know, forcing uh, things like muscular tension. That, that was really not something we were interested in because of course it inhibited everything we were trying to do. So the dynamics of dance between us 
and the communication we had and this sensuous awareness of each other and time was our main goal and that's my passion for dancing so as a teacher though I should just say that of course we all have a system that we use when we when we dance and but as a teacher I would say I have to be very clear that principles are for all for everybody and that systems are selective and fortunately because I have the wisdom of Richard's knowledge from going back to 1950s when he had lessons with some of the pioneers of these systems then I try to utilize those systems in my teaching in conjunction with the principles and that way I feel as a teacher I'm able to help so many more couples if you teach one system unfortunately then you know you are not going to be able to help everybody mm. and of course as a teacher that's really the ultimate goal is to be able to help each and every couple in some way and so I may be teaching quite often something I don't actually I didn't actually do myself mm. but the passion behind it is to be able to pass on a dance philosophy that has been pioneered in the past and and can be continued to be developed uh, you know with innovation and, and so so that's my passion in dancing uh, I had a certain style and a system but I realized that as a teacher I have to be um, open-minded and expansive and, and help try to help everybody so you mentioned uh, it sounds like you've developed uh, a system of your own and of course uh, have uh, learned a lot from the pioneers of, of uh, technique and those those systems as well so can you tell me more about your teachers um, mm -hmm. of course I'm sure you have a few and uh, if anyone in particular made a big influence on you um, it's difficult to pinpoint one I suppose because the thing about uh, your teaching your, 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 your career is that you have these various inspirational trigger points and uh, just you know very briefly as a junior I was so lucky to have lessons every week and he was my only teacher from a gentleman called Colin Twine who was fourth to Richard and Janet in that era and everybody that you speak to of that time uh, hails him as a great dancer so I was just very fortunate to be able to dance with him on a weekly basis and I think that's really how I was able to make that transition to dance with John now his teacher was Anthony Hurley and anybody who's danced with Anthony Hurley knows what a great genius feel he has for dancing. So I was learning really the essence of ballroom dancing by feel and, and understanding what this should actually uh, feel like, how the balance should be, how, how the touch should be. And then when I danced with John and he wanted to have lessons with Richard, I resonated immediately with what he was trying to, to teach because he was a pioneer of principles. He was the first person to really talk about principle in dancing, the truth, science, physics. And so he gave a, a totally new aspect to ballroom dancing. And he was without doubt a pioneer, certainly a major influence in, in my era. So, you know, you've now got, um, an, in the type of philosophy I'm studying about knowledge, you've got this ability knowledge, which is maybe, you know, your natural understanding of how to dance. Some people just can get up and dance. So you've got your natural ability, you've got your knowledge, which is where Richard came in with all these fabulous principles, and then you've got your senses. So I felt that in that region of ballroom, I was able to experience everything. Fortunately, it was just wonderful, very lucky. And then along came the genius John Delroy, who uh, was a legend in, in the true sense of the word. It's a commonly used word these days, but he really was a legend, a genius and eccentric. And I absolutely loved him for it. And he was the gentleman that put our segue together. He also um, gave us all our demonstration routines and his way of teaching was unique, it was visual, and we would enter into a small ballroom at the side of his flat, and he wasn't there at that point, and then the door would open, and I don't know if I can do it, <laughs> he said it, he would walk in, 
he would walk all the way around the room and say, good morning. And then he'd look at you and he'd say, and the lesson today is profile. <laughs> and of course, you know, you were just captured by the drama, the charisma, the point he was making. And uh, it was unique work that we did with him and precious, absolutely precious. It was through him I learned how to breathe in dancing, phrasing, of course. Um, and he was just uh, a larger than life character who I loved dearly. And uh, I'm sorry he's not here for the younger generation really to, to have learned from. And then Latin American, um, I, at 16 years of age, I had lessons with Peter Maxwell. He was still competing at that time. And I have to tell you, watching him dance was a sight to behold. It, he was just magnificent. And to a young 16-year-old, you know, person who, who was desperate to be a Latin dancer, you know, I just thought I've arrived. <laughs> it, it was wonderful. And, uh, you know, great charisma as a dancer and as a teacher. And then I had also the great privilege of having lessons with Espen Solberg. And he made me understand, I think, for the very first time, what the body was doing on a specific beat or half beat yeah. and the detail of his teaching. I, I think that was also a, a, a pioneering time. And what I find fascinating is that he was, you know, a, really a leading light in Latin American, and I'm going back 35 years now, and he's still a leading light today. So I think that is quite yeah. remarkable. And a man who has dedicated his life to all aspects of dance. So great admiration and respect for him. Sounds like you had a wonderful selection of teachers who have influenced you a lot as well. It's so very lucky. Yeah. yeah, very, very lucky. So now going back to you as a teacher, uh, can you pinpoint what makes someone successful as a dancer? Because of course you had the, the opportunity to work with a lot of dancers, with the, probably all the top dancers of already several generations by now. And in that sense, also what makes a good student, it doesn't necessarily maybe have to be the same thing, but what is your view on that? Nice question. Um, well, I've been wrong many times in my, particularly my earlier career, because you know I would dance with somebody for the very first time and think, oh, this is going, this, this is going to be a world champion, you know, uh, but in fact did not transpire to become a world champion. And then I danced with others um, and perhaps not being sure about what their career would be and in fact became world champion. So obviously there's something going on here and I was absolutely fascinated as to why this should be. And just by chance, I was asked to do a lecture in Blackpool uh, entitled How to Win Blackpool. And so I decided to do a study of 22 couples that, 21 or 22 couples that had actually won Blackpool amateur professional ballroom or Latin, mm -hmm. and to ask them four questions and to calculate all this, um, you know, information and research together. And one of the questions was, what was your motivation to win? Now, I got a number of answers. Some were saying that they wanted to be the best, to be the best they could be, um, to be in, to enjoy the learning process, uh, the music. There were a number of questions, but what I garnered from this was that there was a strong desire in each case to be triumphant, if you like, in an area. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, we can. The obvious is to hold the trophy in your hand. That's the obvious. But I don't think anybody actually said that. I think to be the best was really the uh, closest to that you would actually yeah. uh, to, to get. So if you have the desire and the determination that psychologically that is number one, you have to have that. Otherwise, it, I do not think it's possible to succeed. And then in addition to that, you have uh, about 11 or 12 intelligences, four of which are particularly important for dancing you have the uh, kinesthetic intelligence which is your your intelligence for feel for dancing or your basic talent really mm -hmm. um, secondly is the visual side of intelligence which is someone who may watch a couple or watch a video and then actually improve immediately 
once they've seen dancing that may be better than themselves. And then you have musical uh, intelligence, which is, you know, you have a great reaction to music or a very good ear. And then finally, you have the uh, knowledge of principles. So, um, you know, critical reasoning and, and this type of thing. Now, if you have all four of those, plus the determination, then you can be a champion. And then you've got to have a partner. <laughs> and then the partner's probably got to have certainly the determination and at least two of those intelligences if they've got all four well then of course there's the jackpot yeah and then i would say lady luck plays a bit of a role in there and you know i often i sit at competitions and then the champion comes out and we're driving home and i often say to richard if you really think about all these forces coming together you know two people find each other in some cases equally talented with the same you know level of intelligence in all these areas and they win and you know, it, it's, it's just, an, I, I'm, it never ceases to amaze me. Mm -hmm. And of course, I realized why I was making wrong assumptions in, as an earlier teacher, because I was only assessing one thing, and that was their kinesthetic intelligence. So uh, in my later wisdom, I now um, sort of don't make assumptions <laughs> quite so quickly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Till you get to know someone a little bit better. Yeah. yeah. And so do you think these are the same things uh, which make the good student as well? Or is it something different uh, for you? Okay, so as a student, um, I would say you have to have total trust in your teacher. And um, I remember somebody saying to John Wood once, he said, if Richard Gleave told you to jump off a cliff, you'd do it. That's how much you believe him. And I, I do think that every student needs to have that belief in their teacher and uh, I, I think you can also have a coach somebody that yeah. um, gives you great men you know mental training or psychological training and of course these days um, you know often the couples will go to a sports psychologist as well as their dance teacher you know there's so many more specialists mm. um, utilized these days and there were in in our day you know the teacher tended to do everything for you um, so, so that's changed considerably, but I would say you need to have total belief in your teacher and definitely do not have too many teachers because I, I think it's counterproductive and you really cannot progress if there are too many ideas. You know, if you think about it, certainly in my career, I only had one teacher as a junior and yeah. you, you know, to go back week by week, it was hard enough to implement what they wanted you to do. Uh, by one voice so you can imagine there's several others coming in here you're just not going to be able to accomplish what they want mm -hmm. so i would say minimize the teachers and have a small team to enable you to to be successful mm -hmm. okay uh, let's talk about the uh, freedom to dance uh, of course the original first competition that you and richard organized and the movement that you have started uh, can you tell me a little bit about the reason why you started, how it happened, and uh, what is your vision and hope for the future of it? How do you see it develop, or how would you like to see it develop? Because now, of course, it has taken such a big um, uh, part of the dance world. It's in many countries, and a lot of people are part of it. So tell me what you think about it. Yes. Uh, well, of course, it, Freedom to Dance really started as a Facebook page in response to the banning of couples at the UK Championships in 2010. And uh, that affected Richard and I quite profoundly. Um, you know, one can mention many, many couples who were affected by that. Uh, but um, one couple in particular, Marat and Alina, that really did upset us because in their particular case, I think that actually meant a whole lifestyle change. Mm -hmm. Of course, once you're talking about that, this is really serious, serious consequences of this banning. So uh, one year later, we decided we would organise a competition. And in that same year, somebody organised an event in Singapore. So that was the start of Freedom to Dance International. And in that time, so th we are now 10 years along. And of course, this year would have been our 10th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So in the 10 years, we have 26 countries organizing 62 events throughout the year. 
And of course, that's beyond our wildest dreams. We really never expected that to happen. So that's made us very happy. We, this year, we've developed a, a website for Freedom to Dance International. And we've recently been approached by a lady who uh, deals with wheelchair dancers and has asked to run an event with our banner. And so that's really delighted us because if we can now go on to help wheelchair dancing or any other form of disabled dancing for that matter, you know, that would make us very happy. And one of the things I would like to say, you know, is that we were so grateful to our sponsors because they allowed us to give incredible prize money. And in fact, the last time we organized the event, we were able to give 3000 pounds to both the professional forum and Latin American uh, champions. So that, you know, that was just the icing on the cake for us because the whole idea of freedom for us was, was giving back to dancing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we really have enjoyed helping the dance community in the way that we have. And uh, you no, know, it's not really about us. It, the banner of freedom to dance is the it's the principle of it that people follow, and the terminology of it is the semantics of, of it. It's not uh, us. We just happen to be, you know, the caretakers of it in a way. So uh, yes, if it can continue in the years to come, we'd be very happy, and we are always there to help anybody uh, that that needs that needs that. And I know that Richard had many many. Uh, requests to turn freedom to dance into an organization but he was very strong that he did not want that to happen and he felt that if we were to do that as I did that it would have created havoc and that's not really what freedom to dance is all about so we've retained our status as a movement and we're very happy about that and we will continue to do so and then everyone no one's under pressure yeah. everyone uh, can feel safe as it were because it's, it's all about the movement and nothing else. Mm. So uh, if we talk about the development of ballroom dancing in general, um, how do you see it? What do you think is the next stage? How do you think it can evolve? Uh, what is your opinion on that? Well, I would certainly like to see the development again of two big principles of weight and time. Um, I think they've been overshadowed in recent years by uh, space and energy. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see a readdress of that balance. Now I say that um, not to take a retrograde step because I think it was Gustav Mahler that said, do not uh, worship the transmission of fire. No, sorry, worship the transmission of fire. Do not worship the ashes. So in other words, mm -hmm. You, you, you just can't worship what was gone before. Certainly observe it, learn from it and so on, but you can't really go back. You can only hopefully produce groundbreaking work that moves forward. Yeah. So I would certainly like to see attention to those two big principles because in my opinion, that's how you move people. And you know, the joy of actually experiencing what's going on between two people is what ballroom dancing is all about and if there's an intimacy about great ballroom dancing that I would like to see again so perhaps one could say the subtleties need to be developed. Uh, choreographic ingenuity I'd like to see and certainly within the fundamental steps so that we are remain we are authentic to our uh, style. Uh, and I, I say this because I had the fortune to experience uh, a massive change in results in, in one part of our career. And I would actually really like to see greater diversity in results. Mm -hmm. Because we are a very form-based art. And whilst it has probably been like that since time, you know, uh, ballroom dancing began, I don't necessarily think it's particularly healthy state to be in and from my personal experience I, I think there's so many times when I've seen a couple that may have been sixth, fifth, fourth, third, second who on that particular night should have won the competition and I would just love to see the right dancing win on on the right night and you know I, I feel very strongly about that 
the thing that I, I suppose I feel inadequate by saying this is that I don't actually know what the answer is at this point in time. And that's something that needs to be researched and developed. But certainly I would like to feel that couples have the hope and the inspiration that results can change. And, you know, just because somebody that's, that's fifth may be the champion on the night, it doesn't mean that they, that's going to happen the next time. And that's the whole idea about diversity of results. Only if it's the right thing, of course. If, if someone deserves to win every time over a long period, so be it. But I think realistically, um, that, and that's the thing, it's got to be real. And I remember when uh, we had actually been defeated at Blackpool by Marcus and Karen. The second year we, we were champions, we'd been defeated. And I remember going to get a sandwich uh, just before a lesson and the lady said, oh, you, you know, just come back from Blackpool, how was it? And I said, well, we were second. And she said, oh, that's wonderful. And I said, oh, well, I know, but we, were, we won it last year. And she said, well, you, you can't win all the time. And I thought, yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, so I, I see it as simply as that, really. And so I, I'd like to see some change in that area. But um, honestly speaking, I, I don't quite know how that will come about. But um, we will see. We will see. Yeah. Uh, of course, you are very highly regarded as a professional and as a dancer. And I hear a lot of praise about your lessons and information and your approach from our friends who are uh, doing ballroom. And generally, this is, this is the general opinion, of course, about you. But I'm also interested to know what you consider to be your biggest personal success. Uh, well, I think there are two parts to this. Firstly, when our beautiful daughter Claire came into the world, that's the most precious experience I think I can say I have had. And she's a very beautiful person. She has a wonderful soul and she's very liberal in her thinking. And when you, when you bring a child into the world, I actually feel that they're, personality and their nature is already there and that you can guide them along but there's not very much you can do I think to change their basic nature so in that sense we've been exceptionally lucky and Richard and I both feel that as parents to Claire we have learned so much and we feel we've developed as people as a result so that's number one and then the second thing uh, is that I feel very happy to say I'm at peace with myself and as an earlier um, person I, I was not at peace with myself so now it may have been that because I was such a perfectionist um, I was always sort of we could say beating my you know beating myself up all the time about not being good enough at this or that and uh, I believe what's happened over time is that I've learned to accept that voice in my head telling me that this isn't good enough and um, you know I can I can live with that voice and I feel comfortable in my own skin and I'm at peace with myself which is the greatest personal accomplishment I feel that I've been able to achieve in my life absolutely and uh, to round it up, uh, I would like to know what is your biggest and most cherished uh, memory of your dancing career, of course. If there is one or several, that's fine, but yeah. tell us. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, the UK Championships in 1987. Um, we, at that time, the Segway competition was uh, introduced and John Delroy put a segue together for us and we had absolutely no idea how this would be received and uh, after the final of course we danced our segue and the reaction that it got was totally unexpected and we had a standing ovation and in those days for ballroom that wasn't such a, a common thing mm -hmm. so that that was just a, a, a wonderful experience my parents happened to be there at the time as well so that was something that I'll, I'll never forget. I think secondly, to have been in the era of um, Marcus and Karen, Andrew and Lorraine and John and I in those five years where we were 
all competing together. Uh, at the time, I'm not going to lie, it was very stressful yeah. on occasions. Um, but in retrospect, it was a great privilege to be part of that time. And uh, I would say that's very close to being the thing that I, I feel I'm most proud of, really, to be part of that. Um, and also that we're all great friends mm -hmm. now because, you know, if you've competed with, with people like that in that intense cauldron, um, you, you feel attached to them. Although, you know, of course it was very competitive, but I feel very attached to those people. And so to be friends with them, uh, you know, sit and have a laugh and a, and a joke and, you know, talk about those times, I think is, it's a very nice feeling to have. And then just finally, um, in 1998, uh, at that point, we were fifth um, in the professional ballroom and we were hoping that this particular Blackpool would be a, a great year for us. And in the 24 of the professional championship, John rolled off the edge of the floor and broke his fifth metatarsal in the foot. So we were effectively out of the competition. And um, I remember we had to go to the hospital at Blackpool and uh, John said to me on the way back, you know, Anne, you're going to have to go back and watch this final. I know you don't want to, but go back, which I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm so pleased I did because, of course, this was an opportunity. All these years, I've been sitting out, looking back in. And now, I, you know, this flashbulb memory came in. I could see everything in that moment so clearly. And I don't think I've ever seen how to be successful as clearly as I did that night. And so when we got back from London, I remember uh, from Blackpool, I remember John said to me, you know, Anne, we were fifth. We could easily be out of the final if we don't work hard, which we did. We doubled our workload. Um, and that next November at the British National, we would have normally been third and we actually managed to win. So that was, you know, a great change. Wonderful. And then the Star Ball and the UK Championships, um, UK terms, we were second to Stephen and Lindsay Hillier. So we've literally in six months gone from fifth to second. So, um, and you know, we did, it's funny, the brain was so focused on what we had to do. We didn't really think there was any chance that we could possibly win Blackpool. It wasn't even in our minds, you know, just to retain at least fifth or so on, because we, we, we hadn't established anything really at that point. Mm. So we worked incredibly hard and we got to Blackpool and of course we danced in the competition and the audience were very warm because we'd we were unable to dance the year before and um, so the results come along and Bill announces the waltz and we had won the waltz well of course we'd never even taken a dance from Stephen Lindsay so you know this was just unbelievable to us and then the uh, foxtrot was announced and Stephen had, and Lindsay had won that uh, and then the next is the tango and we won the tango so now it, everything's on this quick step and of course the hall it's been so many years since that happened um so the hall was you know the tension in the hall was unbelievable and bill urban he took a lifetime to announce those results and then he announced our name so oh, we came running onto the floor and john got down and he kissed the floor and I remember all these programs flying in the air and I remember thinking, gosh, it doesn't get any better than this really. So although I was not motivated by winning, um, I can't deny that that was a, a really special moment. And of course, there's nothing like that first win. You know, we, we may have danced a lot better on other occasions, but that was a special, special experience that I'll never forget. Especially as it was unexpected, I suppose it made it even more special exactly. and real exactly. for you. Exactly, and that's why I'm so, uh, I feel very passionate that other couples should have the opportunity to experience that. So, um, yeah, that, that's something that I would really like to put some thought into in the future. I don't know how it can be done, but uh, I do really believe that I want other people to experience that. 
mm. because it's, it was a special time and it motivated us. That's the thing, and it would motivate other couples yes. who yes. felt had to produce a great to produce something special, to produce something different, and exactly. also to accept that you might not have a good day. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, you know, there were many times where we did actually win, and I thought, well, we just didn't deserve this tonight. <laughs> Another time, you know, we were second, and, and I thought, gosh, you know, we should have won that. Well, yeah. no, not really, but, you know, so I just think the diversity in results is healthy, and it's real, and it's what we need. And for the audience as well, it's such an excitement. You would stay to them, you would really want to see if your winner is the one that's going to become the winner tonight. And it's exactly. a different, different approach. Yeah. 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 Okay. On that note, thank you very much for speaking to me. It was a great pleasure and an honor. Uh, thank you so much. And please uh, stay healthy and stay positive. And I hope that very soon we can meet each other in real life in some competition and that we can go back to more or less normal at least as soon as possible absolutely and um if i could i'd give you a hug but i can't <laughs> but thank Definitely. you so much once again for giving ladies a platform it's really a lovely super idea thank you so thank much you. and and all the best thank you bye bye bye